Good afternoon and welcome to OAG's uh, latest webinar. Um, it's good to be back. We've had a bit of a break over the summer, a slightly longer break than we'd expected originally. Um, so thanks for bearing with us with the change of, uh, of day to day. Um, it's been a busy few months in aviation, isn't it? Um, and with the recent launch of OEG's mega hubs, we thought that today we would try and focus a bit more on airports perhaps than we do sometimes. So we're gonna be talking a little bit about mega hubs and uh, a lot about aviation in general with quite a bit about airports. Um, uh, it's the first time that OEG's updated its mega hub since before the pandemic, which was, um, I think the last one was 2019. Uh, so it's going to be interesting to see um, how things have changed. I think we can probably all make some guesses in advance as to which airports have risen up the rankings and which ones are languishing further down. Um, but more of that later. Uh, before I introduce our panellists today, um, just a, a sort of a, a roundup or a summary of what we're going to be looking at not necessarily in this order in fact definitely not in this order um, we will be looking at mega hubs uh, we'll be looking at uh, recovery over the summer what have we seen happening um, what's the state of the industry and uh, we're going to be looking at what's coming down the pipeline a winter of discontent perhaps um, as things seem to uh, still be getting hard for still still a hard operating environment for airlines and airports and um, uh, yeah, that's it. That's uh, that's what we're going to look at today over the next hour or so. Um, as always, do uh, use the chat function to put your questions in as we go along. Um, we try and pick them up and weave them into the conversation seamlessly as we're going. So uh, the more questions, the better. It's always uh, good to have a bit of input from all of you listening. So in terms of our panel today, as usual, we have uh, John Grant, OEG's chief analyst. Um, Welcome back, John, as usual. You've been traveling a lot over the summer, haven't you? Lots of long-haul travel, lots of Central Asia. Um, tell us how you're finding flying and, and, and what's your airport experience been like? Uh, hi, Becca. Hi, everyone. Um, well, flying's fine. It's much easier than walking, that's for sure. Um, <laughs> but more importantly, you know, um, it's good to see quite a lot more travel. Um, strange sort of um disconnects still occurring you know resource challenges at, at quite a few airports that i've been through um but people are just i think accepting of the fact that this is the world order at the moment and and just getting on with it um some parts of the world you still see a lot of people with face masks on um and in other parts um you know it's uh, it's almost party time and back to back to normal that creates some very strange um, combinations when you get somewhere like Doha uh, and you have passengers disgorging in peak hours from different parts of the world and half of the people have face masks and half don't. Um, I think the noticeable thing though um, is that premium cabins seem to be full um, and not necessarily of corporate travellers but of um, lots of couples um and people i think taking advantage of the revenge spend uh, that we've been seeing and wanting a bit more space um to a point where load factors in in the premium cabins on the flights i've been in are probably uh, in the 80s and 90 percent and in economy class um it's wide open uh, plenty of space particularly on long-haul flights um so that's that's been interesting i'm sure will change over time but a sense in most parts of the world we're getting back to normal and where the normal things and the frustrations of travel are back for us all to uh, experience. Okay, thank, thanks John. Um, joining us today as well for the first time is Becky Frankowski. Thank you very much for joining us. I know you're um, a fairly regular listener to the webinar, aren't you, uh, Becky? I am. I'm very excited to be here. Um, you know, happy to represent the Atlanta airport and airports in, in the US. Um, yeah. And you know, I, I enjoy listening to these webinars, so I'm super excited to be a part of the panel. Well, it's, it's really good to have you with us, and especially, you know, Atlanta's a, a you know, a really one of the world's largest airports, so uh, really good to have you and your perspective on our, um, on what's happening at airports um, uh, today. Is there anything you would sort of observe, I mean, John's talked more about flying, perhaps, and a bit about the airports, you know, how do you think airports have have, or how, how has Atlanta been able to change over the last couple of years um, in terms of the passenger experience? And there's been a lot of, of changes that have happened, particularly on the like touchless technology side. Um, you know, and I think that that trend is here to stay, particularly at airports. Uh, you know, biometric stuff, um, 
parking where you can it's recognizing your license plate or you use uh, what we call the peach pass here in Georgia so it's it's a barcode that gets scanned as you come in you don't have to use your credit card it just automatically gets deducted so there's a lot of technology that's that's kind of come on board um, you know self-service kiosks things like that 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 had started before the pandemic but really picked up as the pandemic went on yeah, it's really, uh, it's really interesting. Well, we're looking forward to having your insight and thanks for, for joining us today. Um, as always, let's start by looking at what's been happening to global capacity. Um, we've got a chart here that shows um, the yellow line is, is capacity this year. Over the middle of the summer, we just about topped 100 million seats each week. Um, John, where, where do we go from here? Is it, is it up for the next few weeks or is this just is this an anomaly we're seeing in the data and actually we're going to be fairly flat through the rest of the year? Um, I th I th it's an interesting question, Becca. I think um, it's, it's an unknown because all of that is Chinese capacity um, and optimism from the Chinese airlines that they are going to be able to operate um, that level of capacity. Uh, but from recent experiences, um, I think we can be confident quite a bit of it will come out. Um, lockdowns, travel restrictions. Um, this is this is actually Golden Week in China, so it's a week when there'd normally be a lot of uh, people flying around visiting friends and family, and yet Chinese airlines took out two million, um, four million domestic seats this week. Um, so you know, not required. Probably some government intervention encouraging people to stay at home. Um, so, so that's a factor. So I, I think it's very unlikely we're going to see a, a, a bounce back. And if you look at the patterns of previous years, it would be out of skeletal with what we've we've seen from uh, the last three years from the normal sort of patterns. And the summer was good. Uh, you know, we did get up to 105, 106 million seats. Um, really strong um, performance in Western and Eastern Europe. Uh, seasonal holiday makers and you know transatlantic uh, was was good and and since then really we've seen what I would describe as the usual gradual descent uh, towards the winter season um, and that will continue I think for the next couple of weeks we'll settle back uh, we're at 94 million a week at the moment I think we'll go down to about 88 um, perhaps 85 in the next couple of months, uh, we'll see a bit of pickup over the seasonal holiday periods in North America, Thanksgiving, and then obviously the, the Christmas vacation period and the European ski season will start. But, um, you know, we're seeing a more, a more balanced um, capacity supply perspective than we've seen for many years. And I think more importantly than anything else, we're not seeing the schedule volatility we've seen in the last three years. You know, there is a lot more consistency in, in production. Uh, airlines are trying to honor their schedules as best they can, given the resources they have. Um, and I think that in itself, the, the resource challenge that we've spoken about in the past is, is allowing airlines to put out networks and schedules based upon what they now know they can operate rather than what they would like to operate. Because I think they've been caught in the summer um, and we've seen it in the last few weeks where resources have begun to be exhausted again. Um, people have run out of hours in operating uh, aircraft crews. Um, so airlines have had to cancel. We've had some bad weather experiences. So I think generally, you know, it's capacity is looking good. But, you know, there's two sides to this equation. Capacity is obviously very important. But the other side of that capacity is demand. And um, I asked her saying that average load factors around the world have actually slipped back in the last few months. Um, the proportion of corporate travel, I think, is not as strong as it has been. And, and this is peak corporate season. This is trade fair season. This is when every you know salesman used to be out at exhibitions, conferences, doing the Christmas rounds, getting the business banked for 2023. So the lack of that corporate demand um, in a market where so many factors are working against the industry at the moment still, uh, I think makes it a, a, a challenging environment for everyone. Yeah, we will be talking about uh, some of those challenges um, moving forward. Um, let's look at similar sort of data, but for different parts of the world. And we've split out 
China and India from the rest of Asia here because they, they are really behaving in, in quite a different way and, and, and a lot more positive. Um, but, but North America, this sort of pale bluish line here, um, Europe, the green line, um, we're, we're just seeing a steady improvement, aren't we? It's, it's, it's just steady and solid um, capacity return. Um, yeah, North, uh, North America is about only, only 6% below um, 2019 levels at the moment. So that's that's pretty good. Uh, and it's one of the best performing regions in the world. And as, this, as the largest um, geographic region of the 17, you know, that that's a solid performance. Um, it's dominated, quite frankly, by um, the United States. Um, so that's that's interesting. Uh, lots of new capacity being added in the US from low cost carriers. Um, Spirit have got 40% more capacity than they did have this time three years ago. Um, and you have Frontier um, and you have Allegiant and you know, you've got more and more capacity coming into that sector, challenging the conventional legacies. Um, South, Southeast Asia um, and Asia generally, I mean, if you take, as you said, China and India out, you're left with um, markets such as Singapore, Japan, Hong Kong, Taiwan, South Korea. Um, some of those are still in that early stages of reopening. Japan next week will allow international travellers uh, on an unrestricted basis. Hong Kong is easing quarantine restrictions. Taiwan has reopened. Um, so, you know, there's there's lots of lots of optimism there, but they're probably about five months behind the rest of um, the world in their uh, reopening, and that will take time. But ultimately, they are so interdependent on China, uh, mm -hmm. and China is still um, only allowing domestic travel, um, very limited international uh, travel, and what travel there is comes with some fairly tough. Um, restrictions of, before you can even enter China. Uh, it's a, it's a difficult situation. So um, I think I think there are some hot spots. As I said, North America's done well. Western Europe's recovered. Eastern Europe's recovered. Um, some of the smaller regions in the world are doing really really well at the moment. Uh, West Africa is way up on 2019. Uh, Central Asia, um, the stands. Um, are performing well, and there's a lot of activity going on there. Um, but but it's all overshadowed by Chinese capacity and its impact on uh, the rest of Asia and some other markets as well. So, so Becky, I, I'm not sure China's the, the huge market for you. Um, how how are things at Atlanta? Where where are you relative to 2019? I do hope that we're going to stop looking um, at everything versus 2019 soon. But uh, but for the moment, we I think I think you are as well, aren't you? I think you are. We are. So compared to uh, capacity, uh, we're at about 87 percent of 2019. So I think we're you know roughly slightly ahead of, of what the global picture looks like from a capacity perspective, but from an actual passenger. So through uh, the month of August, we are down about 18%. So the capacity is down 13, passengers are down about uh, 18. But it's important to know that 2019 was our best year. We had 110 million passengers come through Atlanta. We're still anticipating more than 90 million for this year. So that is a big number. And you know, even though we're still below where we were in 2019, passenger traffic is back. I mean, we we're 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 full. We're not, you know, we're not we're not quite where we were in 2019, but we're we're back to where we were, you know, slightly before the pandemic hit. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's it's um it's good to know that there's uh there's some reasonably healthy recovery and i think 90 million as many airports are, would uh, would struggle with 90 million passengers wouldn't they so um i want to look at europe specifically now um and, and look at the, the the summer months so this isn't just a european issue but there's been resource issues everywhere as john has alluded to um the chart here shows um heathrow capacity by day um departing seats um and shows where they announced the, the cap of 100,000 a day. It, it did make a bit of a difference, but they've still been operating, as far as we can see in the schedules, well over 100,000 a day. Um, caps at Frankfurt as well and Amsterdam. 
we're not out of the woods, are we, John, with the, the resource issues and finding staff? And I think um, many airports are holding recruitment days, aren't they? I think, I think you're doing the same in Atlanta, aren't you? So let me come to John first. Where, where are we headed with the resourcing? Um, well, good news this morning. Uh, between eight o'clock this morning and uh, our first webinar and now Heathrow have um, announced that they're removing their capacity cap, uh, cap from uh, the WINGS programmes. So, so that's good. Um, at the same time, last week, Amsterdam Skipper said that they will be continuing with their capacity caps uh, because, you know, that's um, it's a real issue there at the moment. And for Becky and Atlanta with Sky Team connectivity uh, into and out of Amsterdam, that that has an, an impact. And I think I think that's the part that people forget. It's not directly the airport where the cap has been applied, but it's also the knock-on effect to other airports around the world. Um, into the capacity that they lose, um, you know, be it a connecting feeder service or a point-to-point -point route. Um, it is it is a frustration, um, and you know, if there if we can take any positives out of what's happening now, and particularly these recruitment fairs, um, well, the first bit of positive news is I might get a job, um, but perhaps you know, more importantly than that, uh, we're planning for next summer. We're not just worrying about the winter. This is airports trying to put people in place who are going to be able to work next summer, whereas uh, we were um, perhaps caught a bit short this year with a lot of airports and airlines um, starting their recruitment drives in January and February uh, of this year. Um, and the recovery was faster than anyone, I think, predicted. We ended up with you know, um, more demand um, than we had resources available. Uh, we had problems getting ID passes and all of the challenges that the industry faced. So I think we're we're trying to get our house in order to be ready for 2023. Um, and for many airlines, I hope that is the case. But it's this fine balancing line, Becca, between taking these people on, if you're a ground handling company, an airport operator or an airline, um, and you know being able to make them revenue productive. Uh, for a period in the winter program, um, because you you don't want to be burdening your business with those costs unless you can see some revenue coming out the other side of it. Um, but it's it's frustrating, and I feel desperately sorry for our colleagues in Amsterdam and the route development team there. You know, um, it's a classic example of a government not helping the airline industry. Uh, they tripled their departure tax last week on the basis of um, environmental concerns, uh, trying to restrict travel, um, remove the, the incremental leisure demand, um, and all it will do is end up creating more traffic jams on the border to Dusseldorf and to Brussels, because people and families with four uh, in a car will just drift across the border to save a couple of hundred euros. Um, you know, it's not joined up thinking by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, um, Becky, where are you with recruitment in, in Atlanta, has that been a constraint over the over the summer months? Yes, so we we actually had an interesting um, June. I think we had, le so we had less flights in June than we did in May, which this might be the first time that it, that's ever happened. Um, so there's been, and that was mostly due to constraints on the airline side. They had, you know, added capacity, but they didn't have the crews to fly those flights. Um, so it's it's been an issue, but it's not just for the airlines. It's also across the airport spectrum. So, you know, from the airport perspective, there's concessionaires, there's security, there's all of these different elements and everybody is understaffed and trying to get people back to work um, has been a challenge. We've had several um, recruitment events. Actually, this week, I think there was an airline that was recruiting pilots here using some of our office space. So, you know, we're trying, we're actively trying to get people on board. And, you know, one of the interesting things is there are people who get offered jobs, but because of the amount of time that it's taking to get security clearance and badges and all that stuff, we'll move on to another opportunity because they don't want to wait four weeks to get paid. So yeah. it's, it's interesting, you know, between security and how how we can we can speed that process up and make sure that we're recruiting people who are good people for the right jobs, but also making sure that we can get them on board as quickly as possible to fill the gaps. 
And that, yeah. Becky, that's interesting. We, um, I was working for a small um, client in Canada who, who had secured a new air route um, to Montreal. And the airline that was going to operate the service, and indeed is operating the service, they went through about five people who they recruited and never turned up on the first day of work um, to be station managers at this particular uh, airport city um, because they found other jobs in the interim. Uh, you know, and they just had to go back to the drawing board. And it, I think it's even you know, magnified where you are because uh, I, you're about 8,000 pilots short of requirement in, in the United States at the moment. Um, and that's, that's a, a yearly rolling situation that is not going to improve, you know. Um, it's we, we tend to think of this as being about, you know, there's not enough people to do some of the perhaps more manual tasks uh, at an airport, but some of the more skilled tasks, um, people are just not there either. It's a really, really frustrating situation for everyone. Yeah. Okay, so that was part of the summer picture. Um, let's look at cancellations. Um, we were talking about cancellations earlier in the year as we went into this sort of resource crunch and then it seemed to get a bit better, but it, it, the cancellation rate seems to be picking up a bit, doesn't it? Um, or, I understand in the States you've had some weather issues and that, you know, we don't, in a way we don't count those, you know, those are nobody's fault, can't be planned, but the, the, there are a lot of cancellations, uh, or there's more cancellations, it seems beginning to happen now um, elsewhere. Is that, it, what's causing that, John? Uh, well, um, Ian was clearly a, a, a big problem uh, last week as it swept through um, Florida and swept through the Caribbean. Um, and, you know, just as a microcosm of the damage and destruction that it can do to an airport's operation, uh, Orlando and um, Tampa have in the previous four weeks been tracking with a cancellation rate of about half of one percentage point, which is pretty typical. Um, and during last week, their cancellation rate went up to 46 percent, uh, where airlines were cancelling at less than 48 hours notice, which we define as being a cancelled flight. Uh, because they were responding to Ian. Um, but there are there are other issues at stake now, Becca. So when airlines uh, in many parts of the world re-evaluated their operations in um, May and June <coughs> and made necessary cuts to their operation in line with available resources, they were working on the basis, I think, of maximising productivity of their staff during the June, July and August period to make sure that they could carry that demand. Uh, and, and basically, they've, they've physically exhausted available hours um, on flights and cabin crew and uh, flight deck staff to a point where they're out of um, their safety limits and they can't operate any more hours at the moment. So, you know, some airlines are down to the bare minimum uh, in terms of available resources. Um, and supplement that with the need for uh, such people to go back and do their um, line training and go back and do their simulator training and other such tasks uh, it's a you know it's a challenging situation um, and it's not just in North America or Europe we're seeing this in uh, Asia uh, we're seeing it in Australia where Qantas um, you know asked their senior management management team to load bags uh, for a couple of weeks um, you know, everyone's doing everything they possibly can to try and improve the situation, um, but it but it is proving problematic. Um, I think it's interesting that in the Middle East we're not seeing the same level of cancellations, um, but this is this is going to be a, a bit of an issue I think for the next couple of months, and will probably rumble through into the first half of 2023 as well. Um, and and, and that you, you talked about, um, you know pilots and crew needing, you know, coming, you know, they, they've used up their hours, but what about just other staff, airport staff, who need to take holidays after the busy summer? Is that is that happening as well, Becky? In, in a... Really, you know, uh, there's only so many days a security agent will want to get up at three o'clock in the morning to do a six o'clock shift at an airport, um, mm. particularly as the nights, as the, you know, nights, uh, draw out and it's a bit colder in the mornings and there's not much you can do with your afternoon as you used to do if you did the early shift and all of these sort of things. These human factors are beginning to 
to play into what we're seeing happening now. And I think, uh, you know, it's going to continue. And for the airlines, this is this is another cost that they are going to have to bear. These last minute cancellations are not cheap for the airlines. You know, in Europe and in North America, where we've got delay compensation uh, in place, then it takes some time um, for that cost to be recovered. Yeah, and, and and to build on what John said, it's 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 a combination of of staffing issues. But in in North America, in the U.S. in particular, this has been an ongoing problem for this year. The last thing that I read said that we are well ahead of where we were in 2019 in terms of cancellation cancellations for um, airports across the U.S. Um, and you know to to the point where the Department of Transportation has actually inserted now that you if you are delayed for a certain amount of time you have to start paying passengers which hasn't been the case up until this point so it's it's an ongoing problem and i think it's going to continue obviously weather has a big impact um, and this season has been pretty bad so far in terms of you know we've had a hurricane in puerto rico and then you know this one in ian that hit florida um, so there's there's an ongoing cancellation problem I think a lot of it has to do with the short staffing across the board. So, you know, pilots, um, flight attendants, but down to security people who, you know, may want a vacation after having been through the pandemic or having been through the very busy summer season that we had, uh, you know, just just the whole staffing issue is is causing a lot of cancellations across the board. Just just anecdotally, Becca, I mean, my wife was um, supposed to come back with EasyJet from Palmer on a business trip on a Tuesday evening. At an hour's notice, when all the passengers were airside, they cancelled the departing flight from Gatwick, so cancelled her return flight. There was over 150 of them uh, inconvenienced. Um, they all passed around the um, website address to claim uh, compensation and get uh, refunds. Um, my wife's claim was over £300 because um, she had to find a hotel you, and another booking. You multiply that by um, 150 people, um, you know, that's that's a £30,000 plus cost that the airline is exposed to um, for a revenue flight that would have probably generated maybe eight or £9,000. And... Um, yeah, so a net twenty thousand pounds down. Multiply that by all the cancelled flights. Um, suddenly, it can be a lot of money for airlines, and, and airlines don't have balance sheets where they can afford to cover those costs at the moment. Yeah, no, I, you know, anecdotally, I've got the same situation. My daughter transited the states, and um, it took an hour and a half to get the bags off. Twenty people going on to the same destination missed their connections, and you know, there's, there's there should be compensation to pay there. So it's. It, but it's it's tricky, isn't it? They haven't the airlines haven't got the money, they haven't got the resources necessary to improve these things instantly. When are we likely to see this situation um, improve? We've got a question from um, John S uh, Smiley. Will things get better in the second half of 2023? That's like nearly a year away. Is it going to take a year to to get better? Um, I think if John could ask that question at the end of 2023, we'll let him know. Um, <laughs> I would I would like to think that it will get better. You know, we have a we stumbled blind into this summer in terms of the speed of the recovery um, and the difficulties of, in recruiting people back into the industry. You know, perhaps perhaps airlines felt that once people had smelt jet A1 fuel that they would come rushing back, um, and they didn't. And you can't blame them. You know, lifestyles have changed. Uh, COVID has uh, you know, transformed many people's ways of thinking. So I'd like to think so. But but to that point, uh, John, I don't think we'll be at 100% 2019 capacity by the end of 2023. You know, we're, we're going to probably finish at about 84, 85% of 2019 for 2022. That's not going to improve significantly as we go into the first quarter of next year, even if China opens. What we'll see with Chinese airlines do is flip domestic to international capacity. So we might actually be net down on Chinese capacity because they'll be operating longer sectors. So we won't see as much production. Um, so 
and European Air, European Airlines, you know, are not rushing um, to relaunch services. They're banned from flying over Russian airspace, so it makes services to China and Japan and things difficult. Um, so I, th I think we might, we might see airlines handling the same sort of volumes as they are now, um, and we're going to have to pay more for those fares. The principles of supply and demand are going to uh, kick in, and airfares are going to be more expensive. Michael O'Leary and Ryanair, you know, always always seems to get it right. Recently said the days of low cost airfares are over, and I would I would agree. I think we're um, we're all in for a challenging couple of years. If you find a bargain, grab it. <laughs> so we're going to have a quick look at um, recovery at some major airports. Um, uh, we've, we've left out Asia because we did a, a webinar this morning that focused more on Asia. So this is in Europe and uh, North America and, and Latin America and uh, an African airport in for good measure and a Middle East airport. Uh, Miami stands out, um, but we've seen a lot of we've seen a lot of change at U.S. airports, haven't we? I think as John was just talking about end of low cost airlines, but actually that's is that the case in the U.S. We're seeing you know more low cost airlines operating from some of these large airports and, and Atlanta's not um, you know not unique in seeing that is it? No so um, you know over the past couple of years we've seen a lot of increase in capacity from our low-cost carriers particularly from Spirit and Frontier adding adding a lot of capacity um, and you know Southwest to some extent is that they're our second largest airline here so we've already sort of had that low cost but you know, Frontier and Spirit have really um, added Atlanta as one of their big focus cities. And so we've seen a lot of added capacity on, on the low cost side, which is, is great for, you know, obviously all of our customers, because if, if, they're, if there's a low cost carrier, even if they don't fly them, they're getting a benefit because the, the, the fares are gonna be lower for whatever, you know, city pair that looks like. Um, you know, Miami in particular, didn't really have a lot of low-cost carriers. They were flying mostly into Fort Lauderdale, and it looks like there's been sort of a shift between, you know, Miami, um, in Miami in particular, you know, with Spirit coming on. I think uh, Southwest started service there, so they've they've seen a big uptick, and that's obviously a big reason why they've got that um, increase in capacity. Mm. Every one of these airports has its own story, Becca. I think it is quite, you know, interesting. Frankfurt obviously is is a lot of that is about the capping that's in place. Um, Los Angeles is a broader California story. Californian capacity is um, one of the few big states in the U.S. that is below average recovery, uh, which I think is surprising for California. Uh, but a bit more expect... dependent on international travel, I think, isn't it? Yeah. Perhaps elsewhere. Yeah, absolutely. Gateway to Asia and China, and and that's not there at the moment. Um, you know, you look at Mexico. That's not performing badly. You look at Istanbul, that's not performing badly. What do they have in common? Essentially, they stayed open during COVID um, and are reaping the rewards of that. And, you know, in the case of Istanbul, um, Turkish Airlines are on a huge um, capacity and network expansion drive at the moment, uh, which is which is building their hub there, uh, which is great. And Miami pinched a load of capacity from Fort Lauderdale, Hollywood. Um, international um, spirit move services down, JetBlue move services down. So it, it's you know everyone has its own story, um, and it's there's still a long, long way to go in this uh, recovery. Yeah. Okay. Um, I wanted to look now at some of the challenges that we have. Um, not least is the fuel price. We often talk about. The fuel price and i think in the, the, the earlier in the summer when we we're doing webinars we were highlighting the, the fuel price going up and what impact that uh, would have it's beginning to come down now it's not coming down as fast as the crude price but this is is really contributing isn't it to the difficulty of rebuilding profitability uh, amongst the airlines i know the u.s airlines is you know as as we've seen over the last few years it typically is the big u.s airlines that are making money and very few airlines elsewhere um, but but this is this high fuel price is still an issue, isn't it, John? Ah, extremely challenging. You know, this is um, if you look all the way back to 2015, where double the price we had then. If we look at 2019, when we all said, oh, you know, things are quite benign, the industry is doing well, it's heading for a record profitability. We're about 55% up from that point, um, and 
and there's no sign of this coming down. You know, what we're seeing at the moment is perhaps the traditional reduction in oil prices that you see through the summer season uh, as as the weather improves and we burn less oil. Um, that is only going to go one way in the next couple of months, and that is up. Um, you know, as we burn more oil, we see um, some of the OPEC producing countries uh, agreeing on quotas. So that will that will help the price stay strong. Um, and of course, for many parts of the world, the biggest problem, or well, the second biggest problem about this price, Becca, is it's in dollars. Um, and US dollars are a real, real expensive wow. currency at the moment compared to every other currency in the world. You know, if you're an airline in Europe and you're paying for your fleet in dollars, you're paying for, paying for your fuel in dollars and you haven't hedged, then this chart you just moved on to here, which which looks like um, my heart attack readings, um, <laughs> it just, it's just really, really scary in terms of how the dollar has strengthened against every major currency in the world. Of, of course, it it affects tourism flows and, and who travels where makes travel to some places more expensive and from some places more expensive. But for you in the States, do you see um, any impact of the strong dollar? Is this not something you're having to think about or are you beginning to think, oh, we're going to have more visitors from Europe this next summer? You know, it's 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 tough because when you have high fuel prices, that that in general means less profitability for the airlines, and then they start looking at where they can cut costs and all that stuff. So it always impacts the overall you know network that the that the the airlines are flying. Uh, in terms of you know, obviously there's been this pent up demand that you know people can't fly to certain places, and so the strong dollar you know makes it cheaper for us in the US to travel to places like Europe and other places. So I expect that, that if the dollar remains strong, that there will be more people who are willing to fly and, and travel to Europe. Um, I don't know that it necessarily will have a huge impact because there's also the inflation situation. I know that's a global situation, but it's it's particularly bad in the States. So depending on, on the inflation versus um, strong dollar, you know, it, the demand side of that is, is always a question. And there's obviously a lot of pressure on what's going to happen um, with inflation and what that does to discretionary spending. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, it, it, I mean, you know, Becky, you're really lucky in some respects because I think Delta is the only airline in the world that owns an oil refinery, aren't they? Um, but, you know, there, there is, there is damaged by this as everyone else. And it, it's not just um, the price of oil, it's actually the supply of fuel. Um, you know, we heard, well, not it's a fact, we heard that a United Airlines service um, from, uh, I think it was Cape Town had to be canceled because there wasn't sufficient fuel for uh, the return sector. Um, so, you know, this is, it's not just about the price, it's about the supply, the production and getting it to the right places in time. And it's going to be with us throughout the uh, throughout the winter. There's no doubt about that, and beyond. And however hard we try, you know, sustainable aviation fuel, um, electric planes, hydrogen planes, they are still so so far away that this is a real issue for the industry for the coming probably 10 or 15 years at least. The supply of oil. Yeah, and 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 some of the uh, the OPEC countries are are looking to restrict supply a bit, aren't they? In this the next little while, yeah, so absolutely. no yeah, sign of more 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 oil coming on stream. No, sadly not. Sadly not. So we tried to, um, you know, until this webinar, we've talked about fuel price, we've talked about lots of other issues facing the industry about resources. We haven't um, we haven't looked at the US. The strength of the dollar before um, we tried this time to um, put together a whole all the different things that we can see on the horizon now which uh, feels like an awful lot of downside risks for this winter um, one of the other ones we haven't spoken about before that seems to be emerging is is a weakening of cargo demand and and we've often i know for myself i think for john too with you know decades in the industry we've seen weakening cargo demand as a as an early warning sign of of demand in the passenger side of the business is that um do you have a sense that atlanta 
Becky, what's happening with cargo? Um, are, are there concerns that demand for, for uh, freight is, is definitely weakening um, and that that will affect that? You're seeing that as a, a forward indicator? So cargo has definitely softened in the last couple of months. Um, you know, 2021 was our record year for cargo. We had 731,000 metric tons that came through the airport, and that was our, our peak year. And so, you know, that shift from, from in-person shopping to e-commerce really accelerated the cargo growth here in Atlanta. Um, in the last couple of months, we've, we've seen a big swing down in terms of, of air freight. Uh, flying in and out of Atlanta, which, as you said, is not a great sign because usually that's an indication of of other, uh, you know, trade and recessionary. I don't want to use the word recession, although I just did. Um, you know, that's that's a an indication that we may be shifting towards a, a more challenging economic situation in the United States. So, do you see it as a more challenging challenging economic situation, or or might it just be a, a going back to how people shopped before? Um, you, you know, we we obviously we all saw this massive increase of online shopping um, through the pandemic. Is there a bit of a correction taking place there? I mean, my sense is that we're actually still all shopping online, so it probably is more of a weakening of the market. Um, but is there an element where we're going back to shops and we're not seeing the same online shopping? So, you know, when, when I look at the overall cargo data here in the U.S., the biggest declines that we've seen are really in places like China, where they've had a lot of restrictions and, you know, China and Asia in general. So, you know, some of the other Asian markets where they probably were being fed by China and then, you know, sent to the U.S. So the, the fact that China is still, you know, not reopening and that there's been a, some restrictions on the, the Chinese side are having big impacts on global supply chain and those impacts are hitting at at the uh, the air sur the air cargo level on I think more so than on like the shipping vessels. So, you know, there's been a shift I know from shipping vessels from the west coast to the east coast, but we're not seeing that sort of same shift on the the cargo side here for air air cargo. Uh, Becca, I think, you know, if if you if we'd had this slide 12 months ago, um, then the sentiment in these in these bubbles would have been very different. Obviously, we were all worried about a new variant of COVID. There was probably a little bit of concern about staff resourcing, but we naively thought everyone would come back because that's what they've always done in the past. Um, you know, lack of profitability. Well, it was so bad it could only get better. Um, but what we're adding here is a whole host of other external factors that we just did not expect to see and are creating double and triple whammies um, to, to the situation that we face. You know, high energy and food prices, inflation, uh, recession, uh, growth projections being low. Uh, I, I low. didn't quite go as far as putting recession in there. I just said growth projections low. And I know we've uh, got somebody's commented, where's the recession? Bernard, Bernard <laughs> would have loved you to put recession, but he's a constant pessimist. So that's no surprise about that, aren't you, Bernard? Um, so, you know, lots of lots of uh, things here that that are sadly fresh to the chart, but conspire to make the, the trading environment harder for, for the airline industry and, and all of the stakeholders. And not just not just the aviation sector, but the tourism sector, uh, the whole travel ecosystem, you know, is, is going to have to have to contend with all of these things. Um, and it, it's not going to be easy. Uh, we never the dollar was strong, but we never expected it to be as strong as it is now. Um, and clearly, we can thank the UK government for, for some of that strength. Um, so there's there's lots of lots of things conspiring against us at the moment. Equally, let's not forget it doesn't take long for some of these to turn around. Um, mm -hmm. The margins are such in the airline industry, and you know that paradigm point where we flip from quite large losses to an opportunity in growth markets. Um, will come round again at some point and when that happens um you know there's a lot of people who will be well placed to take advantage of, of the industry yeah yeah so we um we've got a slide here um we had some discussion this morning as to how relevant this is but we thought we'd take a look at how the stock prices for various um airlines have changed from um I compared yesterday's price with uh, the 4th of October 21. And this chart here just shows what proportion um, it is versus where it was a year ago. Um, 
you know, is there anything that we can imply from this? Is it is it uh, the, the fact that the stock prices generally are all quite a bit down? Is that um, lack of confidence, or, or can we not read anything into this particularly? Uh, well, if we can't read anything into it, Becca, it would have been a waste of a slide, wouldn't it? Um, <laughs> Well, we had some discussion this morning. We had a guest who wasn't sure that it it reflected um, market confidence. In I, mean, way I, that... I asked for this slide to be here because I, I think it, it, it it's a good way of looking at the sentiment within the investment market to airline stocks. And you know, the investment community is normally pretty sharp at calling it right, and and it's a it's another it's another um, temperature point that we can we can look at on. Uh, the airline industry and the aviation sector and for many of these stocks you know this time last year we were saying it's going to get better things are moving in the right direction etc cetera, etc cetera. Um, you would have expected their stock prices to be at least as good if not better at this moment in time than they were 12 months ago now Cathay Pacific's um, stock price is better um, and that doesn't surprise me because you know this time last year it was a junk bond um, whereas now it's only a trashed bond um, so it, it's all relative. But there are some very big airlines um, where the sentiment is, at least compared to last year, not as strong. You know, we've got carriers like United Delta and American Airlines, the big three US carriers, who accounted for more than 35, 40% of the airline industry's total profit in 2019, sitting here with analysts saying that, you know, their stock price is 40% or more lower than it was this time last year. Um, now, you look at Spirit and their performance actually isn't bad or the analyst rating isn't isn't bad for them and yet they've been acquired by JetBlue, um, uh, who are bottom of this, this particular list. Um, so I think it's just another way of looking at the situation we face in the industry and where the those people outside of the industry view um, the current state of our um, industry and, and where the where the you know the challenges are um, and I think I think it's going to take quite some time for these these bonds and these stock prices to improve uh, throughout the winter you know this is these are long-term investments now I mean if you take the IAG group um, the stock price two years ago was about six pounds and I think it's less than one pound today uh, you take easyjet um, their stock price uh, was up at about ten pounds. That's down, I think, at about two pounds seventy today. So you know they they've all moved and um, they're not showing any great signs of recovery at the moment. Okay, something to watch. Maybe we'll come back to that perhaps in a yeah. in a subsequent webinar. So on to mega hubs. Um, we've just got a couple of slides here with some of the headline results. Um, OEG launched mega hubs um, just a, a week or so ago. Um, and as I said at the beginning, hasn't been updated since 2019. And it's a calculated value um, that, that OEG calculates based on uh, the number of international connections that it's available at an airport versus the total number of destinations you can go to. So it's a, it, it's a sort of artificial figure, but it's a good measure of how that airport facilitates and enables connectivity. Um, the standout, um, uh, I guess, insight from this this year is that it's just dominated by US carriers isn't it because they've got a they've got a big open market um, they've been operating at you know with strong capacity relatively uh, throughout so um, is, is that is, is this just a blip John and in a year's time we're going to see all the other airports we used to see in the top 10 top 20 um, return it's um, it's unique um, this Becca, you should hold on to this as a historical artifact and put it in one of those tubes and bury it and see in 25 years how much it's changed. Um, you know, this is this is a as always a snapshot, a moment in time, and um, there's no Singapore's, there's no Hong Kong's. Um, you know, some of the major Asian markets are, are just missing from here at the moment, um, and they will come back. But it is, it does show, I guess, what we we've we've noted in the past that North America and particularly the United States relative to other parts of the world because of the vast and large domestic networks and the multiple hubs that all of the airlines operate or major airlines operate um, has been relatively immune from some of the, the bigger disruption that we've seen through COVID-19 uh, and has performed um, much better than many others. I mean 
taking uh, Becky's own airport in Atlanta, you know, it's it's moved from eighth to third. Um, and it's it's performing very well at the moment, 90 million passengers a year. I mean, that's phenomenal um, this year compared to uh, many other of its peers. So it's uh, it's a good performance. And you're pleased with that, Becky? Yes, you know, it's it's interesting because you know, when you look at the connectivity, obviously Chicago and Dallas, you know, if you look at the total number of destinations that are in and out of Atlanta compared to Dallas and Chicago, we're below, and that is reflected in, in this in this index. You know, we have 212, no, 219 destinations um, out of out of Atlanta. Um, most of those are, I think 155 of those are domestic. So you know, we have big connectivity to a lot of places in the United States. I think there's maybe three states in the United States that you can't get to without having to connect in, in the United States. Um, you know, it's 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 a good, and, and because of how Delta has integrated themselves with Atlanta, most of our passenger traffic is connecting traffic. So it's been built to sort of shine in this in this index because um you know we have 60 percent of passengers are connecting in atlanta so it's it's built to to connect people to from one place to another yeah yeah it's uh it's certainly doing that we also run the numbers looking at um low-cost air services so uh international low-cost services um in the same way Obviously, these aren't online connections. We're just taking all the possible uh, flights that passengers could connect to and from. Um, some interesting findings here, John, isn't it? I mean, we, we were talking a few, you know, a couple of years ago, really, about the growing trend for self-connecting. We haven't really discussed that for a couple of years. But, you know, more and more passengers are very comfortable flying on low-cost airlines. They can self-connect. Connect. There's tools to help them do that. Um, so it's interesting to see airports like Delhi and Bombay at the top of this with, with a carrier like Indigo um, being the sort of dominant carrier in those airports now. I, th I think what we're seeing, I mean, self-connect virtually stopped um, during the pandemic for a couple of years. You know, it was, it was complex enough trying to travel um, on an interline ticket with the same airline uh, and showing the necessary pieces of paper, but to try and self-connect and have another another book full of approvals and vaccine certificates because you're connecting between two um, airlines would, would probably phase most people. Um, but but the, the prominence of India in this list, I think, is, is fascinating because it, it, it essentially shows, you know, India is purely a low-cost market now. It's dominated by low-cost airlines. Yes, Air India are trying to, um, uh, you know, rebuild their network and um, they They've got some grand plans and they place some new aircraft orders, uh, but they, they're lagging so far behind Indigo and SpiceJet and others that quite frankly, they'll never be able to catch up. Um, and you know, they're becoming increasingly marginalized. Um, and there are some markets where that self-connect is almost like a stopover passenger. You know, these, these are markets where you get a lot of people who are independent traders, have friends and family somewhere and they'll stop for a day on their way to their ultimate destination either to conduct some business or to see some friends family or relatives um, but it, but it is interesting there and, and and some of the some of the US airports that appear in this list perhaps have a larger um, leisure focus and they do corporate focus so I think it's interesting that you know uh, Denver and Las Vegas are, are holding in three and four and number five is Orlando um, you know they're quite big uh, leisure destinations uh, rather than business, uh, similarly Fort Lauderdale. Um, but it's but it's interesting. And and right down the bottom there, number 25 um, is Riyadh in Saudi Arabia. And we haven't we haven't really raised that issue at the moment, Becca. But broadening this out, you know, what is currently happening in Saudi Arabia in terms of their aviation market, um, their rapid um, Vision 30 plan, uh, the development of the new airline. Um, in Riyadh, uh, where I understand the, the senior executive management team are already um, and about to be announced, and the CEO has been announced, um, Tony Douglas, formerly at Etihad Airways, um, the reposition of Saudi, uh, the Neon project, so many things like that. Um, you know, Saudi Arabia is going to become a very significant 
uh, market in its own right and a very significant uh, disruptor to aviation in the Middle East uh, in the coming years as, as the airlines there rapidly expand and start seeking transfer traffic. Um, going to be a, a fascinating watch for the next 10 years. Yeah, I'm sure we, we're going to be touching on Saudi Arabia in future uh, future webinars. That's great. Thanks very much. We've got um, a few slides to come, which are sort of newsy. It's things that we observed that have happened over the summer, and we thought, well, let's take a look at that. So first of all, um, United and Emirates have put aside their, um, I guess, their spat that was was taking place a few years ago, and and are going to announce that they're going to code share from next March um, with United flying from Newark to Dubai. So who gains from this? We we've got two charts here. We've taken some OAG um, the OAG mapping tool and shown on the top um, the United flights that would connect uh, within a six hour window onto that uh, United flight to Dubai. And below that, we've got the United flight and what it would connect to on Emirates potentially um, for a week in May. Who, who gains here, John? And why is this happening oh, now? Yeah, undoubtedly, United, Becker, if, if the map visualizes and tells the story in some ways. Um, although some of those points that you have on the United online connections are served non-stop by Emirates, you know, this, this gives mm. another frequency, another opportunity to connect. Um, if you look at it the other way and you see what on online connections there would be with Emirates, um, you know, then quite frankly, anyone flying New York to Dubai and then to Tehran is likely to be arrested when they get back in the US. So uh, it might be a connection. It's not one that's going to work very well. Um, no. But, but it, 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 it's interesting, I think, to see um, how Emirates are changing their thinking about partnerships and code shares. This, this is the airline that said, never, never, never will we enter an alliance. And this is this is as close as you could get to being in an alliance without being in an alliance. You know, their their ambition between this is these two airlines is for a seamless product. And the word seamless is quite interesting in itself because five years ago, um, I don't think Emirates would have entertained uh, working with United, the differences in their product levels, service offerings, in-flight cabins, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, was was vast, um, and it's a testament to United as to how they've improved their in-flight service uh, and consumers' perceptions of their their service. That you know, Emirates are quite comfortable to put co-chairs on on a long-haul premium uh, cabin uh, with a, a U.S. carrier. So I think I think that's interesting. Um, but I think actually all three US carriers have improved their long haul premium products in the last couple of years. Um, but it's this is what's the response from the other three big carriers in um, in the Middle East region? Does this mean Qatar and American will do more than they're already doing? Um, does this mean Etihad might find an angle to work with someone? Uh, it's um, it's it's beginning of uh, perhaps that whole area of industry partnerships consolidation. Um, realignment of uh, alliance players and who does what and when. Yeah, yeah, and it's certainly a, a topic to watch, isn't it? We've been, you know, observing the, you know, the role that alliances play, and um, and then perhaps moving a bit towards equity um, partnerships as well, um, instead of just alliances or co-sharing. But this is a an, an interesting development, I think, um, though though not going to happen for another six months or so. Another thing we had a look at was um, we were just interested to look at what was happening at different airports around the world in terms of how their um, their movements are distributed through a 24 hour day. Um, so what you're seeing here on the chart is a heat map and I apologize to John who's colorblind that the red and green I know doesn't work for him and I always forget. Um, so we've got GMT along the top from 00 hours to 2300 hours and we've got a bunch of airports listed in sort of their geographically sort of as you move across the world. Um, and you see the proportion of flights that happen in each hour long slot. And so the greens that are zeros are the nighttime slots where really we're not seeing any flying happening. I think we were looking at this, John, weren't we? Because we were sort of interested to see where airports had a bit of, um, if, they're, if they're resource constrained, is there scope to, you know, to actually even out how much um, flying is happening at different times of the day? And I think the conclusion is, 
there probably is. I know it's not quite as that simple, quite that simple because there's um, you know waves of traffic come in from uh, different parts of the world, and you might have have constraints on when those flights can arrive or depart. But there is there's something here, isn't there? Yeah, there is. I mean, you know, we know the power of the hub and the concentration of the activity that goes around that. Um, no more so than in, Atl in Atlanta, sort of late afternoon and the, the peaks there. I mean, there's lots of connecting people going back through TSA and being put through security, etc. Um, but but we talk a lot about how the industry is changing and how it will change, and it makes you, you know wonder um, at most airports in the world. Becca, there is no distinction between airport landing charges um, at one particular time of day and another time of day, uh, and we don't we don't we don't encourage or we don't see a lot of um, pricing around peak and off peak uh, capacity and its use. Um, we're not flexible. We're not creative as an industry at those sort of things. And it struck me when I saw this. You know, this is an opportunity perhaps for some of the airports that are uh, secondary in markets to look at how perhaps they price to encourage more services in the off-peak hours, um, or indeed how could airports could perhaps, uh, and dare I say it, increase their revenues just a little bit more by, by pricing a bit more uh, aggressively in the peak hours. Um, well, what do you think of that, Becky? It's a, I can see from here, Atlanta, aside from when uh, it's it shut through the night, actually you've got a fairly even distribution through the day, haven't you? you um, I won't ask you if, if you're pricing in that way to make it, it very even, but is it is it something you have a look at? Um, so, you know, we have on average like over 1,900 flights a day in and out of Atlanta. Um, and those hours that you see kind of the, the zeros, it's that's kind of our peak time for cargo. So cargo usually flies overnight. That's when the cargo flights get in. All the other times are really where the passengers, you know, are. I actually might steal John's idea and, you know, bring that to our management and say, hey, if we're trying to encourage air service and we want people to fly at certain times, can we incentivize them to, you know, land at a different time? Now, Atlanta has some of the lowest landing fees in the world, so I don't know how much more, you know, uh, low we can go. But you know, it's it's a great idea to say if you're now if you're now flying at a peak time, which we have several peaks in Atlanta, depending on whether it's international or domestic. You know, how how can we use that to kind of incentivize people to fly when we want them to? I'll yeah. take two percent, Becky, for uh, every one you move. <laughs> <laughs> I could have predicted John would say that. Okay, we've got, I'm, I'm aware we've just run past four o'clock, but we've just got one more slide we wanted to show you. So uh, just bear with us if, if you will. Um, OEG is just about to launch its busiest routes annual uh, report, just to look at which are the busiest routes worldwide. And in there, they also look at the longest routes. So um, this is the top 10 longest routes uh, being operated in the world at the moment. Uh, JFK Singapore, operated by Singapore Airlines, is the longest. Um, for some reason, just shows up as two miles different to Newark, Singapore. Um, some long routes here, but these aren't this doesn't necessarily you get kudos don't you john for a long route and it gets headlines but they're not necessarily easy to operate are they or profitable or no no ask ask air new zealand how easy it is to operate a new long haul route um <laughs> they've, they've had they've already had challenges on auckland uh, jfk um you know stronger than anticipated headwinds um well didn't you factor that in uh, to your thinking leaving 65 passengers behind and bags on inaugural flights because they just didn't have the payload range. Um, so so some of these are, are vanity. Um, and although they, they look impressive, you know, they unless there's a high business class component, uh, they, they struggle to um, make money. We've got new aircraft, new technology, you know, um, they're more efficient than they, they ever used to be. And some of these clearly will make sense. Um, one of them that doesn't, I think, make sense to me at least is JFK Manila. Um, you know, that's a very long way and that is predominantly a leisure market. So uh, I struggle to see how that would work. Um, I think a Auckland JFK, um, I know, you know, it's, it's important for Air New Zealand. It's part of their strategic thinking, but I think it's going to be a challenging route. Um, Perth Heathrow, uh, has, has performed quite well for Qantas, but I think the long term, you know, 
it's all about Project Sunrise and, and getting their Sydney non-stop to Heathrow for them. Uh, and of course, Becky, you're in this list as well. You've got a Joburg that um, takes a long time to get somewhere, doesn't it? Yeah, it's, I, I want to say it's at least an 18 hour flight uh, time wise, uh, but that flight has been operating for a long time in Atlanta. So Delta, it's a Delta flight. Um, they've actually added a Cape Town component to it. So now it's going to be a triangle route. Um, so that starts in December. Uh, so that'll be interesting to see kind of how that that added Cape Town uh, component works for, for the Delta flight. Oh. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah, I mean, Cape Town's a very strong winter destination, um, Southern Hemisphere, summer, et cetera. Uh, I'm sure it'll do very well. Mm. Okay, that's, uh, that's where we've got to with our slides. Um, Becky, any final thoughts that anything that you've been itching to say that you haven't had a chance to share? Any observations about where the market is? Or um... I, I would just say that you know we continue to see capacity fluctuating. So you know, as John said, the winter is going to be kind of I think the barometer for what happens next year. Um, you know, but we continue to kind of see the fluctuations in capacity when we look at it month over month. Um, but I'm I'm optimistic that that we are moving in the right direction. Yeah, it sounds like you're in a, a good place in uh, in Atlanta though, and uh, uh, with Delta and, and and other airlines there, it's uh, it, it's uh, easier, perhaps an easier place to be than many other airports at this point in time. Um, John, any final words from you? No, I, I, you know I, I echo Becky's sentiments, and she is in the right place. It's warmer than it is in London at the moment, and that's <laughs> that's got to be good. Um, but we will get through these challenges. This is what this industry does really, really well. You know, it, it faces every adversity and moves on and, and finds a way forward. Um, and it's, you know, the environment we face is not any different to many others we faced in the last 20 or 30 years. And uh, we'll still be able to talk about this next year because uh, we'll all, all have worked our way through it, I'm sure. Great. Thanks very much, both of you, to end on such an optimistic note. Um, thank you for joining us. Um, we will be back um, next month. Uh, it will be uh, sometime mid-November. We haven't quite got a date yet, but do look out for the email from OEG um, giving you the date of our next webinar. And we look forward to seeing you then. Thank you. Thanks. Bye-bye. Thank you.